from 1999 to 2012, the greatest distance runner in America was not from America. He was from Kenya. Bernard Lagat uh, became an American citizen. And as an American citizen, he was a four-time Olympian. He holds seven American records. And he had a unique secret to his success. And his secret was rest. See, elite distance runners around the world, they, they never stop training. They train year-round. But every year, for five weeks, Bernard Lagat takes his running shoes, throws them in the closet, and doesn't bring them out again. He says the only thing he lifts during those five weeks is a fork. <laughs> he coaches his son's soccer team, and he doesn't think about running at all. And he says that that's the secret to his longevity. He has dominated uh, the long distance running in this country for, for years. And it's because of his sustained rest. This is what he said. He said, my runs are very hard. Everything I do is hard, but the body is tired. You're not a machine. Rest is a good thing. So the Bible tells us to run the race with perseverance. We want to finish the race, like Paul says. I've run the good race. I fought the good fight. We all want to finish the race. We want to finish the race well. But we're not going to finish the race unless we learn the secret of rest, like Bernard Lagat did. It, the Bible tells us that rest is essential and builds rest into our weekly schedule. And it, it's given to us all the way back in the second chapter of the Bible, in Genesis chapter 2. We Listen to what Genesis 2 says, verses 2 and 3. On the seventh day, God finished his work from what he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. So rest becomes the reason for the Sabbath, this day that will be set aside uh, every week to take this one day of rest. Now, understand that God didn't rest because he was exhausted. It's not like a, a laborer who has worked all day building a house and, and moving bricks and lifting bricks, and by the end of the day, every muscle in his body is exhausted, and he just collapses. And by the end of the week, uh, he collapses because he's exhausted. That's not how it was with God. God spoke the world into being. Remember that. It's called the divine fiat. He just spoke, and it, was, it had happened. Let there be light, and there was light. So after speaking the world into being, it wasn't as if he was, had worked up a sweat and he was exhausted, but he did this to set a pattern for us, that six days you work and one day you rest. And we're to follow that same pattern that he started in creation. Now this is stated very thoroughly for us in the fourth commandment. It's found in Exodus chapter 20. In fact, the commandments are found in two different places. We're going to look at this fourth commandment, both in Exodus 20, but also in Deuteronomy chapter 5, because the explanation is different in the two passages, even though it's the same author. Moses wrote Exodus. He wrote Deuteronomy. He listed the Ten Commandments twice. But when he gives the fourth commandment, he gives two different reasons for the Sabbath rest. Let's look at the first reason he gives us in Exodus 20. It's verses 8 through 11. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is, the, is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them. But he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. You see his reason? First, he tells you to keep the Sabbath day holy, and the reason is found in, in verse 11. For in six days the Lord made the, sa the, the earth and the sea, but he rested on the seventh day. His reason for you keeping the Sabbath goes back to creation, the pattern that God set for us in creation. That's the reason that you should work for six days and rest 
on the, se on the seventh day. Now, I think most of us know that the seventh day, the Sabbath, for the Jews was, of course, Saturday. That changed after the resurrection. When Jesus rose on a Sunday morning, the following Sunday, his, his followers gathered to celebrate the resurrection. And every Sunday after that, they gathered and they called that the Lord's Day. And that has become for us our, our Sabbath day, our day of rest, our day of worship. So when we talk about the seventh day and you're saying, well, Sunday is the first day, not the seventh day, don't be confused by that. It means one day set aside out of every week. For us, it turns out to be Sunday. The Sabbath helps us to maintain our balance. We're to, we're to work hard without becoming workaholics. And that's a tough balance to find, to work hard without becoming a workaholic. Verse 9 says, six days you shall labor and do all your work. So we are to work, that's for sure. I mean, the Bible never endorses laziness. In fact, Paul says, if you don't work, you don't eat. That we are to work, and we are to work for uh, six days. Now, in our culture, it might be five days. Some people might even work less than that. But we are to work hard, but we're not to work all the time. We are to take a break every single week from that. Work is a gift from God. Some people think it's a curse, but it's not. In, the, in, the, in Genesis, when God creates men, he gives them jobs. He tells them to tend the garden and to care for the animals. And he gives them work, and work is a gift. And sometimes we don't realize that until we lose our job. And then we are praying for a job, and we're looking for a job, and we finally get a job. Then we say, thank you, Lord. It's a gift. But we're not to worship our work. It's not, uh, it's not to be all-consuming with us. And unfortunately, for many people, it does become all-consuming. So there's a saying now that says, too many people today worship their work. They work at their play, and they play at their worship. Think about that. They worship their work because it becomes the most important thing to them. They think about it day and night. They, they never stop thinking about work. It, it becomes an idol in that sense. that it, it takes the vast amount of your energy and your thought and your attention. They end up worshiping their work. They work at their play. Look at the way people um, go about recreation these days. I mean, uh, there's a lot of effort and a lot of money that goes into it. It can be exhausting, this recreation, <laughs> because people work at it so hard, and it, 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 they take it very seriously. But unfortunately, the next line is that they, they play at their worship. That worship doesn't occupy that place of importance that it once does. They'll go when there's nothing else to do, but it's not something that they put a lot of energy into. Maybe it's a, more of a spectator sport. They'll go and they'll watch the show and they'll listen to the music and, and then they'll, they'll go home and it's over with. The priorities have gotten all twisted around. So the Sabbath is given, us, is given to put our priorities back in place. It's a built-in day off every week so that we don't forget to set apart time for God. That's the human nature is because we can't see God, we get caught up in the things that we can see. We're attracted to the shiny things. So we like material things. We have schedules, and our schedules get busier and busier and busier until they crowd God right off of our schedule. So the Sabbath is built in every day so that we don't forget God. Our society has largely abandoned the idea of the Sabbath. Do you remember a day when all the stores were closed on Sunday? You couldn't go shopping if you wanted to because they were all closed. Well, that's all been forgotten, except today there's, there's a handful of stores, Chick-fil-A, uh, Hobby Lobby, and about uh, 17 major corporations run by Christians have uh, refused to open on, on the Sabbath, on Sundays. There's a, one of the largest camera stores in the world up in, in New York City. It's owned by a, a, a group of Hasidic Jews. They keep the seventh day, the Sabbath, and they are very serious about it. In fact, they close their shops at 1 o'clock on Friday to begin the Sabbath. And you cannot buy anything from them uh, from 1 o'clock Friday on. They did this on, Good Fri on Black Friday, if you can imagine. The day after Thanksgiving, the largest shopping day in the world. 
And people said to them, how, how can you possibly close your store on Black Friday, the biggest day of, all, of the year? And they said, we answer to a higher power. People have gone to the leaders of Chick-fil-A and, and these Hobby Lobby and others and say, how can you compete with other stores that are open on Sundays? They're bringing in millions of dollars worth of revenue, and you're closed that day. How can you do that? And they say, we trust God that he will supply for us in six days what we need. But we're being obedient to him because did you remember in the commandment it says, not only are you not to work, but your servants are not to work either. So how can a Christian force other people to work on the Sabbath even if he takes the day off himself? So these people take it seriously and say, we're going to trust God. And ultimately, that's what the Sabbath is about, is trusting that God is going to supply for you in six days what other people are going to work seven days for. You might remember the story of this farmer. He was the only atheist in town, a small little town, all, all made up of farmers. And his farm was right on the corner, the intersection that led to the church. And every Sunday, he was out there working when the other farmers took the day off and went to church. And they all walked by him, and they all saw him working on Sunday. And he would mock them as they walked by. He would say, you better get to work on that. You know, you better start watering your crops. You better fertilize. Look at my crops. And his crops were wonderful. And sure enough, when the harvest came at the end of the, of the summer, his crops were better than every other farmer out there. And he mocked them and he said, look at this. You guys took that day off every week. I worked every day and look at these crops. And one of the farmers as they walked by just said to him, God doesn't always settle all of his accounts in October. They trusted God that they could take that day off and he would provide for them. It's largely the way we say when we, when we tithe and we give 10% of our income, we're trusting that God can provide everything we need on 90% of our income that we can give 10% to him and be obedient. Well, with the Sabbath, you're trusting that you can give one day to him and he's going to provide for you. But sometimes people get afraid that if I don't work this day, I'm going to lose that promotion to all those other guys who are working every, all through the weekend. And the boss is going to see that they're working longer hours than I am. They're going to get promoted above me. I'm going to miss that promotion. There are a lot of Christians who have had to say no to a promotion because it's going to require working on Sundays. There are Christians who have said no to, to entire jobs and have given up jobs because it requires them working on Sundays. We trust God. The Sabbath is about trusting God. I want you to look at the second place in the Scripture, the second place that this fourth commandment is given to us. It's in Deuteronomy chapter 5. And what I want you to notice is how different the reason is. The same author, Moses, wrote this. And the same commandment is to take off the Sabbath. But look at how different the reason is at the end of this commandment. It's found in Deuteronomy 5, starting verse 12. Observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy, as the Lord your God has commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son nor da or your daughter, or your male or female servant, or your ox, your donkey, or any of your animals, or any other foreigner residing in your towns, so that your male or female servants may rest as you do. Now that all sounded the same, didn't it? But watch the next verse. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt, and that your Lord your God brought you out of there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God has commanded you to observe the Sabbath day. That's a little different, isn't it? In, the other, in Exodus, he says, to do, take that day off, not do any work, not let any of your servants work, for the Lord created everything in six days and rest on the seventh. Now he says, remember that you were slaves in Egypt and the Lord brought you out of there with a mighty hand. We know the story. God liberated his people from slavery. He brought them out of Egypt. And here, God is tying together the Exodus and the Sabbath. What's the connection between the fact that God brought him out of Egypt and we are to take off every one day a week? 
it might be that what he's saying is that the Sabbath represents freedom from slavery. Anyone who works and overworks is a slave to his work. Anyone who cannot rest is, from his work is a slave. Today, maybe it's a slave to that need for success or a slave to our materialistic culture or a slave to our employers or a slave to our own greed or all of those things. The slave masters will abuse you if you do not rest and if you don't practice the discipline of the Sabbath rest. So the Sabbath in some ways is a declaration of freedom. But there's more to that as to why he ties the Sabbath to, the, to, the, uh, to God taking them out of Egypt. The Sabbath actually points to Jesus Christ. Now I know that's a strange connection, but if you'll follow me, and you're going to have to really pay attention on this. If you'll follow me, I want you to see something about the Sabbath you may have never understood before. It's found in Colossians chapter 2. This is Paul writing about the Sabbath and about, uh, about a few other things. And he's going to start in verse 13. And what we're going to do is we're going to see a connection between the Sabbath and Jesus Christ. He says in verse 13, When you were dead in your sins and in uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness. We'll get to that in a minute. Having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us, he has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed all powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Now, before we get to the next part where he talks about the Sabbath, let me just explain what he just said. For centuries, because everybody broke the law, they were indebted to God, and that was a debt they couldn't pay back. But Christ paid the debt for them on the cross. When we uh, pray the Lord's Prayer, we say, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. We're talking about the fact that we have all broken God's law. We're all sinners and we ask him to forgive us of our debts. Well, Christ paid for those debts on the cross when he took your sin upon himself, and the debt, that what he owed for that sin was, was his life. The wages of sin is death, so he paid for it with his own life, and he paid for your debts. So he says, you want, he canceled the charge of your legal indebtedness. He nailed it to the cross, triumphed over it on the cross. Now, look what he says, look what he says in verse 16. Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or with regard to religious, the religious festival or a new moon celebration or a Sabbath day. Watch carefully here. These, including the Sabbath day, these are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. The Sabbath day, along with the festivals and the other things, the Sabbath day is a shadow. It was not the reality it was pointing toward the reality, and he says here, the reality is found in Christ. The shadow is a, re, is a, is a, the Sabbath is a shadow of the reality, and it's pointing toward Christ. Now, we are to rest in Christ. We once rested in the Sabbath, but now we are to rest in Christ. The Christian life is all about this, about resting in Christ. Let me explain further about how this ties in. Remember, he said you should honor the Sabbath because the Lord brought you out of Egypt. When the Lord brought them out of Egypt, what work did he require of the Jews in order to, to be free? What did they have to do to win that battle? And the answer was nothing. They just had to obey him and walk out. He fought the battle for him, for them. He defeated the army. He parted the sea. He closed the sea and, and defeated the Egyptian army. The Egyptians did not have to work for their salvation. And it was a picture of our salvation because Paul says, we don't have to work for our salvation. We can cease all of our work and rest in Christ, in his finished work on the cross. That's the connection between the Sabbath and Jesus, that we don't, we don't no longer have to work to earn our salvation. Christ has done all the work for us, so we can rest in Christ. Look what Jesus himself said about 
himself in the Sabbath in Mark chapter 2, verse 27. Then he said to them, the Sabbath is made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Jesus is saying, I am the Lord of the Sabbath. He is the Lord of rest. There's more. Look at, look at Matthew. He's, in Matthew 11, Jesus says, Come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. This actually raises the bar a little bit because, you know, the, the Sabbath was about resting your body after working all week, resting your mind perhaps. But he says, when you rest in me, I will give you rest for your souls. That's a rest that only Christ can give you, is rest for your souls. One of the great blessings of being a Christian is that Christ can give you a rest that only comes through Jesus. The world cannot offer the rest for your souls. So when we think about Sabbath rest, it's, it's important that we think about taking that day off once a week and, and de devoting that to God. But there's so much more to it. it. It also means that we rest in Christ. We're not working for our salvation so we can have rest for our souls. This is not to say we shouldn't take... Sunday off every week, a one day to, to honor God, to keep our life in balance. So people sometimes ask me, well, what should we do with our, our Sundays? I mean, a lot of people, you know, that's the day they catch up on their chores. They'll cut the grass. They do their chores. Is that wrong to do that? One of the things I want to say about it is that we don't want to mis make the mistake the Pharisees made. They became very legalistic about the, about the Sabbath. They had hundreds of rules to, dis to determine what you could do and what you couldn't do. In fact, they thought Jesus was breaking the, the Sabbath himself when he would heal a man on the Sabbath or when he would, his disciples would break off food and eat it. They thought they were breaking the Sabbath. And that's when Jesus said, no, the Sabbath isn't, isn't uh, the man isn't made as a servant to the Sabbath. The Sabbath is made for man. So we don't want to become legalistic about the Sabbath. But I would say this. Worship is very important on the Sabbath. The day that you set aside... It should be a day when you worship God. So the fact that you're here on this day, I commend you because this is a, a good thing to do. It's the right thing to do on a Sunday. Do you know that in our, in our country, since in 1978, 55% of people said they, they attended church on, on the weekends. That number has gone down to 55% in 1978. That number has gone down to 27% now. Church attendance continues to drop and drop and drop partly because people are working at their recreation and they're, they've got a lot of things to do on Sundays besides going to church. And so going to church has taken a lower and a lower priority. I do believe that part of our part of what we should be doing on Sundays, on the Sabbath, on our Sabbath, is to worship God, to, to gather with other believers, to not neglect the gathering together, but to gather and to worship and praise God on that Sunday, to learn in His Word and grow in His Word. Another thing that I think is very appropriate, though, is to enjoy God's creation. And here's why I think this. In the original mention of the Sabbath, we read about the seven days of creation. At the end of each day, God would create something. He would pronounce it good. He would stop, step back and look at what he just said and say, it is good. On the seventh day, he stepped back to admire his creation. Someone said he, his rest on the seventh day was like the rest of an artist who has completed a masterpiece, and then he steps back to admire his work, his creation. So I think it's perfectly appropriate. That's what God did on the seventh day. He stepped back and admired his creation. I think it's perfectly appropriate for us and a good use of our time to rest from our work and, our, uh, and all of those things to not only come and worship at church, but to get out in nature and to enjoy his creation, to admire his creation and to see what God has done, to see how the heavens declare the glory of God. And you see his fingerprints everywhere. You see his power and his majesty everywhere.
Resting on the Sabbath ultimately is about trusting God, as we said before. Many Christians have, have done that. They've trusted God by putting God first, even if it means passing up a promotion or passing up a job. If you obey God, if you take that time off work and trust him to care for you, he will provide for you, as he always has. So the purpose of the Sabbath is to enjoy God. The purpose of the Sabbath is to enjoy the freedom that he's given us in Christ, to find rest for your souls. But there is one more twist to the Sabbath, and that is that the final Sabbath rest is still to come. I want to read a passage from the book of Revelation, chapter 14. Listen to this. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Blessed indeed, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, for their deeds follow them. Someday, all of us are going to have our final, go to our final resting place. We are going to ultimately have that rest in the Lord when we stop breathing, our, when we breathe our last breath. And he says that they, you may rest from your labors when you're in heaven, when you're in the presence of God. That is considered our, our final rest. So when we think about the Sabbath, I want you to think of trust God, keep the Sabbath, enjoy God's rest now and forevermore. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you that you loved us so much that you set this day aside for us to rest. Lord, you created us. You know how we are wired. You know that we require rest every single week. Lord, we, all of us, have made the mistake of trying to um, get a little extra work in and to work through the weekends and to work seven days a week, and we know that eventually we break down. Lord, your word is you give us this rest because you love us. You don't want us to forget you. And Lord, we desire to be obedient to you and to remember you. Lord, we thank you for the freedom that we have in Jesus Christ. We thank you that we can work, we can rest from our work of trying to of earn our salvation and just rest in Jesus Christ. Thank you that you give us rest for our souls. We love you, Lord. We praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Right now, we're going to invite you to stay seated and um, just reflect on what exactly the Lord is telling you this morning about where this applies to your life. And we're just going to sing this song, and I hope you could just enter into his courts and lay down your life before him again. And ask him, where in my life do I need to rest? Where Yeah. Sure. 